Last week, as we gathered together for worship, we noticed that the storyline in Deuteronomy shifted from Moses the leader to Moses the teacher. And his lesson was clear that following God's word is the key to experiencing life at its best. When Moses was giving that lesson, he recalled the day that God spoke directly to the people. It's recorded for us in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 12. Moses writes, Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of his words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote them on two stone tablets. In reflecting on that day, Moses reminded that present generation that to keep God's covenant would bring blessing into their lives. And it would remain to be seen whether or not they were actually up for that challenge, whether or not they truly would follow God's decrees. But here's the thing, perfect performance was never really the issue. God had already witnessed their rebellion and he knows what's in the heart of man. But what God was doing was that he was revealing the path forward, a path that was meant to lay aside the obstacles and encumbrances that so easily entangle us. So Moses, the teacher, is going to continue his instruction by emphasizing the reason why we should follow his decrees. And what what lesson does Moses then have to teach us today? Well, before we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4, why don't you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you so much for these opportunities that you give us to open up the Word of God together, to listen to these historical accounts and glean from them truths that we can begin to um, employ in our everyday life. I want to thank you for the ministry of Jesus that just sheds even more light on all of these Old Testament references and stories, seeing its culmination in the very one who came to give his life a ransom for the sins of men. Thank you for this opportunity, and may we leave blessed, challenged, motivated, to share our faith with others. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The other day I was um, reading an article and I came across a reference to a speech that was given back in 1863 by President Abraham Lincoln. Um, It was on April the 30th, and it was uh, a day, uh, if you would believe it, It was a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Let me read a portion of the proclamation that he made on that occasion. He says, it is the duty of nations, as well as of men, who owe their dependence upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon. To recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by a history that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. The awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicting upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. 
Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has grown, but we have forgotten God. Wow, what a sober warning. What a, what a, 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 a voice of clarity, no doubt in very, very dark times. But Abraham Lincoln, he raised his vision and began to reflect more and more upon God's self-disclosure to us as a path to find this sense of strength and purpose and vision once again. Moses is doing the same thing for us. Moses is reinforcing the fact that God spoke with his people, seeking to provide for them direction in the days ahead. It comes with a sober warning, though. And that warning was to avoid the deceptive trap of idols. Pick it up in verse 15 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. He says, you saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an image, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman or like any animal on earth or any bird that flies in the air or like any creature that moves along the ground or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping the, the Lord your God has a portion, a portion to all the nations under heaven. The message is clear, right? No idols, because idols corrupt. Idols offer a deceptive view of reality. They lure us into placing our confidence in the wrong place. When you read this text, I hope it doesn't go past your notice that what is listed is actually a reversal of the created order. It was the creation of man and woman, right? Male and female that came on that sixth day. But here, this order is reversed. It goes from... The, the image of male and female, animals on the earth, birds in the sky, creeping things, fish, sun, moon, stars. All of this to show that the, this is all upside down. And I hope it doesn't pass your notice as well that Israel was just taken out of the land of Egypt where they had spent over 400 years in enslavement. As inhabitants in that land, they experienced a wide range of idols in Egypt. In fact, maybe you know this, but the plagues that God brought upon Egypt that would eventually lead to their deliverance was actually an attack on all of the gods that they worshiped, from frogs to the river to the Nile. All of this was to show the impotence of those idols that they worship. And as the text tells us, creation was to be enjoyed, not worshiped. Creation was a blessing that God gave to all the nations. Listen to these sober words that the apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter one. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, he says, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. You see, people got caught up in the creation 
and it made it into something it was never intended to be. We are not pantheists. We don't see that God is, rep is, is, is in all of the creation. You know, you read poems about gods in the wind, or the sunset, and et cetera, right? But I hope you understand by this text that Moses just gave us and what we read about in Romans 1 and other places that God is not creation and the creation is not God, right? It is not he and he is not it. God is the one who sits above his creation. He is the creator. And then to make forms and idols and bow down to them as if the idols themselves would provide power and direction was an affront to the very God who was disclosing his will and his ways so that they might hear this word and it would they would experience the best of life. But you can see that this is a trap. Rather, they ought to focus on what God's True intention has been. Again, look at verse 20 in our text. It says, but as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. Moses is reminding them that they are God's people, set apart, a people of God's own choosing. Moses is gonna have more to say about this in the chapters that follow, but I want you to recall the promise that God made to their forefathers, Abraham. We talk about this often, but it is, it is absolutely a, a foundational covenant that God made with Abraham that's saying that the descendants that would come from Abraham, God says, would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. And not only did God say he would bless them, but he would give them land and he would give them posterity so that they would continue to grow so that what? They would bless the nations around them. God told Abraham that through you and your descendants, I will bless all the nations of the earth. And that's why the witness that we are to bring to the world is so important. And so the Lord brought them out not to serve idols. The Lord brought them out, not idols. We're part of God's family. We're this inheritance now that God is now going to give to Israel as they possess this promised land. So they are to avoid the temptation of making idols of what are lifeless and instead they ought to put their, their attention on their identity. Children of God's own choosing. And why, is he, why is he telling them to avoid such a trap? Because actions are going to have consequences. Those actions, they are, they are going to affect their present. Listen again here as he tells them in verse uh, 21. He reminds them again that the Lord was angry with me because of you. And he solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance. He tells them, I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan. But you are about to cross over and take possession of this good land. See, this text is really an illustration as to why they ought to consider what Moses is teaching them to be of vital importance because actions have consequences. And Moses now is giving his personal situation as an example of that. Moses, Moses is reminding them for the third time in just these four chapters that his fate has been determined. His disobedience is not going to be overlooked. He is not going with them as they enter into this promised land. And yet he adds that their future is not yet determined, right? He goes on to say, but you are about to cross over and take possession of this good land. So there is this sense of promise 
This is wide open for you. Don't fall into the same mistake that I did. And as we've been reading your forefathers, he goes on and says this, be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. You know, that word that was given on Mount Sinai is the same word that God now is giving to the Israelites camped on the borders of Moab. It's the same word. In fact, they're told not to forget this covenant, right? These 10 commandments that God has given them. And when, when Moses writes here that they are not to make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything, it's the same words that are found in the, as the second commandment of the 10, where he says, you shall, make, you shall have no other gods before me. God is jealous over them. He has only their best in mind. But God is also just. And our entrance into this family requires that we only, not only trust him, but that that is demonstrated in the way we live out this covenant that he is establishing. And that's in the present. What about the future? He goes on here in verse 25, he says, after you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long but will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. Do you notice the word if in this paragraph? Their future is gonna be determined by their actions. And those actions are gonna stretch out into the future. And this is no empty threat. God says, if you live this way, it will be addressed. You will quickly perish. You will not live long in the land. You will be destroyed, scattered. Only a few will remain. All of this is gonna be seen in the exile in the years to come, part of Israel's dark history. And when they get there, notice what it says here in verse 28. Here's the irony of this all. He says, they're gonna be taken out of this land because of all of their, of the proclivity that they have to idol worship. You know, recognizing these idols power that they, they don't have. And now they're gonna be taken out of this land, pushed out into exile. And when they are in exile, notice what it says in verse 28. There you will worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot hear or see or eat or smell. Under judgment, they will do what they have freely chosen to do, serve other gods. But while they're there, they will discover the impotence of these gods. The idols that have been made are lifeless. They can't do anything. They can't see, hear, eat, smell. I wrote down in my notes here that those standing before Moses witnessed the judgment that fell upon that previous generation. It was their parents, right, that wandered in that wilderness for 38 years. If you needed a lesson that actions have consequences, that God is calling us to a faithful obedience to him, to his word that he has given to us as a path on which to follow. Here is this great illustration. It's staring at them right in the face. But I wrote down here, I says, I wonder how that generation explained their circumstances. 
I wonder what the reason was that they gave for their 38 years of wandering around in this wilderness. What do you think they said to their children who no doubt wondered why they were still out here in the desert? Why, if God had made a promise to take them out of Egypt, to bring them into this promised land, why are they not there yet? What do you think happened around their kitchen tables when they gathered to eat or when they you know, uh, engaged in, in, uh, in the services there with Moses. What, what do you think was being shared back and forth? Do you think they recalled God's displeasure? Did he, do you think they told people this has happened because we were disobedient to what God had directed? Or do you think that they blamed Moses or just poor timing or bad luck? It's interesting to me how we try to explain the mess away But how do you explain the mess that we find the world in today? And more importantly, what do you think is the path forward? What do you think it's gonna take for us to get out of this mess? But be careful, because how you answer that question, it may reveal where we truly are placing the source of our hope. You see, there are a whole lot of voices in our day. They promise things that, like freedom is found in the casting off of restraint, advocating for a new definition of what is right and good and just. Talk to them about the commands of God, and what do you normally hear? (laughs) You, You hear that the commands of God are seen as archaic, limiting, simple minded foolish. No, in the climate in which we live, hope, they say, is found where? Just listen to the news, open the papers, think about the national discussions that are taking place. Is it hard for you to to, to really hear where the sources of hope for a, a path forward is to be found? Hope is found in what? Sexual liberation? or perhaps in an education that's untethered from any religious instruction? Or how about it's your, the, 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 the path out of this mess is through financial independence or political system, or maybe the strength of a mighty army. Is that what we think our hope comes from? Is that where we're going to find deliverance from all of this mess? See, those things can become idols. We pursue those at the expense of listening to God and his word. And this is nothing new. Fast forward from Moses' time and now look into the future. When Israel now is on the verge of being exiled from their land, Babylon is going to come in and destroy Israel, taking it completely over, burning to the ground its temple. Listen to these words of Jeremiah, the prophet. He writes this in Jeremiah chapter two. He says, as a thief is disgraced when he is caught, so the house of Israel is disgraced. They, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets, they say to wood, you are my father, and to stone, You gave me birth. They have turned their backs to me, not their faces. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, come and save us. Where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come if they can save you when you are in trouble. Think about that. This kind of liberation that is promised in our present culture? Is it delivering anybody? Or do we find ourselves only more and more living in a very hostile kind of environments? It it seems that that the, the, the culture as we know it is crumbling on so many fringes. Where is this deliverance? If it's gonna come with better education or more money or a more powerful army, or a different politic. 
Moses has said, following God's word is the key to experiencing life at its best. But if we take God's word and throw it to the side and in its place, create all these other idols before us, then you could have all the degrees that are hanging up in the wall, but those degrees are not gonna save you. You can have all the numbers on a bank account, but that's not gonna buy you out of trouble. No, I get it. Money has its, its um, <laughs> money can do a lot of good. It, it pays for these Bibles. It pays for these gathering halls, right? It, it can do a lot to help alleviate people in their suffering. But it's not the money, it's the people who are motivated with that money. Because that same money could be oppressive. It could be used to destroy. It's always about the condition of the heart. And what God is saying, if you set your mind and affection on me, if you run after my decrees, it's a pathway that leads to this life at its best. But there is a path back. Notice what he says here in verse 29. But if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your forefathers, which he confirmed to them by oath. You see, this is a posture now that is key to freedom. It's the path that leads us back to God's heart. Isn't that what it says here in verse 29? You will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. The path is to be marked out by a humility that we demonstrate before God, as well as a devotion to his decrees. It's interesting to me that that same word that is recorded for you in Matthew 4, 29, is also taken by the prophet Jeremiah on the verge of this exile, and in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. For you will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. Don't you see it's the same word over and over again. Just fast forward generations and it still comes back to the same key. The change of a heart that humbles himself before the God who created not only the heavens and, the, and earth, but he created you and me. And not just the knowledge that he is the creator, that he is God, but I then now willingly find myself in a posture where I want to serve him, to learn from him, to keep his decrees. God's desire was for them to prosper. He delights in showing mercy. They may prove faithless, but God always remains faithful. And that's even in the presence of the consequences that remain. Moses, the teacher, is telling them, choose wisely. Avoid the trap of placing your hope in, life, in lifeless, you know, um, objects. Put your hope in the one who gives life. Follow after him. And so he begins to close these words by referring to former days, long before your time, from the day God created man on the earth, Ask from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything so great as this ever happened? Or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire as you have and lived? 
Has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation? By testings, by miraculous signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by a great and awesome deeds, like all the things that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. See, Moses is trying to reason with this generation now that is perched on inheriting this new land, telling them what is this path forward? What could they expect? Where is the key to this freedom? And it's always going to be about humbling ourselves before God and putting into the practice the things that he teaches. But he underscores here that the Lord is incomparable. The Lord has already gone before showing his watch care and his love. So why would anyone substitute idols for the promise of his presence? Can I show you just one other text here that's found in the book of Isaiah this time? I, I, I do these things just to show you that these aren't just isolated thoughts. These are the same thoughts that are gonna be continually referred to over and over again, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New as well. I can point to you numerous places where Jesus is echoing these exact same words. But listen to what Isaiah says. In Isaiah 46, he says, to whom will you compare me or count me equal? To whom will you liken me that we may be compared? Some pour out gold from their bags and weigh out silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up in its place and there it stands. From that spot, it cannot move. The one cries out to it, it does not answer. It cannot save him from his troubles. Remember this, fix it in mind, take it to heart. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. See, that's why we are being exhorted to follow his word. Because there is no other like him. He has demonstrated that by his power and the glory that he has already exhibited. Moses is speaking to that generation who were just one generation away from those great miracles that we read about because they needed to be reminded again. It's something that, it's not hardwired into us, but each and every one of us has to come to that conclusion where we see God, where we see the Lord as God and there is no other. When that takes place in your life, then it, it's a natural thing for you to want to do what he says because you trust him, you have confidence in him. But if I have the confidence in my own strength, or my own national you know, um, allegiance, if I, if I have my confidence in other displaced places, then don't you see I'm susceptible to running on a path of my own doing and missing out on the life that God is promising. And we see that happening over and over again. That's why we're told, choose this day whom you will serve. Because you're gonna serve somebody. He ends here by saying, you were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. From heaven, he made you hear his voice to discipline you. On earth, he showed you his great fire and you heard his words from out of the fire. Because he loved your forefathers and chose their descendants after them, he brought you up out of Egypt by his presence and great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you into the land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. His display of power was simply so that we might gain confidence that he is the Lord, 
that there is no other. And this is a God who's already demonstrated that he loves you, that he chose you, that he carried you, that he fought for you, that he provides for you. Because as the text tells us, the Lord always has our best in mind. And that's why he disciplines us so that we may experience true freedom. He provides direction in the midst of this broken world and he always keeps his promise. So it's decision time. And what's the decision that we ought to come to then? This is what Moses is seeking to instill into those who are listening to him. He ends by saying, acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. See, that's the why. That's the why we follow his commands because there is no other like him. And if you're not convinced of that, then you're gonna find a God in some other places. In your own wisdom, in your own strength, in your own resources, in your own ambitions and passions. And they can run in opposition to what God is truly calling us. And sometimes we will not find out those lessons until it's too late. We have climbed that ladder of success only to find it leaning against the wrong building. Now, when I read these passages, I realize that to keep his decrees and commands is so that it will go well with you and your children after you, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. Acknowledging his authority, demonstrating our commitment by living according to his word, something that happens every day that we are alive. We choose to serve him. But can I just add this one thing as we're closing our time today? This, is, this isn't serving him so I get. This is not a prosperity gospel. Remember, these words that Moses is sharing to these Israelites, they are also going to have to battle the giants, right? They are going to have to engage in battle to possess the very land that is being promised. All of this points to the reality that they, we, live in a contentious world that oftentimes stands in opposition to God's truth. That's why storms are coming. Jesus didn't, didn't you know, um, you know uh, run away from that. He acknowledged that. He just said, hey, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who has built his house upon a rock. And when that storm comes, when the rains fall, the floods rise, and the winds beat against that house, your home will stand. But it's also seen in the conflicts that arise, the brokenness that's in the world around us. Can you not remember the Beatitudes back in Matthew when he talks about the poor in spirit about those who mourn, about those who are persecuted, about the peacemakers, the pure in heart, all of them finding entrance into this kingdom of heaven. God is here for all of it because he has come to redeem this broken world, to offer us a narrow path, a clear direction, that will lead us out of this mess. But it's gonna take an allegiance to him and a commitment to his word. And that, my friends, is what this teaching is all about. Last week, Moses the teacher taught us following God's word is the key to experiencing life at its best. Today, he taught us the reason why, because the Lord is God and there is no other.
Let's pray. Father, this allegiance for one's heart, the call to love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength is as valid in the days in which we're living as it was in the days that you first uttered those words. If we displace you for whatever reason in our life, it will set us on a course, Lord, that very often is in opposition to the truth that will set us free. Sometimes the consequences of those choices are not felt immediately. We might be exhilarated by the ride until it stops. And there's always consequences. Sometimes they're not harvested right away, but they come. And then we look back and we see that we've had no pleasure in them. That we would trade it all for a different decision. I wonder about those past generation that as they were wandering in that wilderness that those among them, they came to that conclusion. It would have been so much better if they had just heeded God's word. Lord, help us to have ears to hear. Turn up the volume on your voice that we can see clearly that there is none other, that you alone are worthy of our life. And then we can run on the path that you set before us. I pray all these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.